everyone. Welcome to today's panel discussion on commercial contracting, doing more with less. My name is Melissa from Law Trades. In case you don't know, we are a platform that allows busy GCs to do more with less by using our platform to find flexible remote support, particularly in commercial contracting. I'm super excited to introduce our moderator for today, Laura. You most likely know her from How to Contract. She'll be guiding the conversation along with our fantastic panelists today. Laura, I'll turn it over to you to get started. Great. Thanks so much, Melissa. And thanks to Law Trade for having us all on. I'm super excited about this topic, super excited about these amazing panelists who uh, Law Trades has, con you know, uh, asked to come on and who have agreed to come on. So before we kick off the conversation, how about we start with introductions? And I'll start with you, Haley. Sure. Hi, um, I'm Haley Gonzalez, Director of Commercial Counsel at a firm um, of fintech uh, in the lending and payment space. Um, I've been at a firm for about five years and manage a team of nine paralegals and attorneys. Um, prior to that, I worked in investment management space. Um, prior to that, I don't remember. So <laughs> it doesn't matter anyway, right? Very excited to be on this panel with y'all. Awesome. Awesome. How about you, Jonathan? Can you tell us about yourself? Sure. I lead the legal team at Crunchbase, where I focus on the four big C's, commercial, compliance, corporate, and claims. I started my career as a litigator with a large law firm in LA and have spent the last decade in-house. I've worked in entertainment, global architecture space, and now in technology. Awesome. Awesome. How about you, Jasmine? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jasmine. I'm general counsel at NT which is a SaaS platform that helps child welfare agencies more quickly place children into foster care. Uh, before uh, my role at Vinti, I was deputy GC at Patreon. Before that, I was AGC at Pinterest. Started my in-house career um, as corporate counsel at 24 Hour Fitness, and before that was a litigator in big law. So I feel like I've seen a lot of different things, um, scaled a lot of different places, and I'm really excited to share this panel with everyone else here. Wonderful. And last but not least, Mike. How you doing? My name is Mike Molina. I currently work as a vice president of legal and deputy general counsel at, at a startup called Flock Safety. It's based out of Atlanta, and we make prime finance technology. So the, the technology is built with machine learning and artificial intelligence within an ethical framework. Uh, so we started when I joined, we were about 100 people. We've, we've grown exponentially to about 650 come this year. Um, so super high growth and just exciting, uh, exciting time. And I'm equally excited to be on this esteemed panel. I've been a Law Trades fan. So uh, very happy to be invited here and convene with you all. Awesome. Awesome. Well, and this is such a great group to be talking about this topic about doing more with less when it comes to commercial contracts, because we all know how commercial contracts are. There's, it's like a mountain that you can never climb. We're Sisyphus just trying to keep going and keep the ship moving and not let anything important slip through the tracks, but at the same time, keep that speed of contracting. And that's the challenge. You could do that if you have a you know a ton of people, but when you don't have the staffing and the resources, you still have to keep get things done and the business still needs to keep moving. So that's the real theme of what we're going to talk about. So we're going to start the conversation talking about who does what. And this is really the conversation around roles and responsibilities. And we want to start off with one because at the core, this is the most fundamental question you have. And it's one that sometimes gets overlooked. We just focus on contracts and intake and process and really starting out with who does what is such a great point. So let me ask you, Mike, how do you manage workflow with your stakeholders um, at Flock Safety? Yeah, so my stakeholders are pretty much the sales team, right? So the sales and marketing team, people that are out on the streets, selling the product, engage with the community. Um, and now we have a fancy schmancy pro product but, uh, uh, that, we, that we manage for, for processing, but this is doing more with less. So let me tell you how it was when we were at the 100 people mark, right? Yeah. Uh, when, when we were uh, considerably low tech, you know, small legal team and just trying to make do. Um, and, and one of the secrets that we found was actually, I'm sure there are a bunch of people on this call that internally may use Slack. Um, you know, they have, they have a Slack corporate account and that's how they communicate. Uh, and what we found was that Slack actually had a, a, a build out tool for a workflow uh, mm -hmm. that was ingrained into the system. And from that, we were able to create a channel um, and add all the salespeople to that channel. 
and then have this really cool pop-up. So it's in the dialogue box, just as if you were going to put a meme in or put an emoji. Right next to that, there's a little button that you would play. Five questions would pop up. Please link me to the sales force, link to the contract. Um, you know, what is the contract value here? When do you need this buy, right? So that we could triage uh, turnaround time. And then another open format box that just comments, what do we need to know? Hey, Mike, you know, this is that call you were on last week. You know, th th this is a renewal for a vendor, whatever it is that's going to help me uh, evaluate the contract. And what we found that to be incredibly successful, incredibly free, um, and, and very low tech in a way that the sales team was able to use that. And I think that's how we were able to do more with less in that situation. No, that's such a great example of trying to find ways to do more with what you've got, and especially free, because a lot of people are have, have you know low budgets or no budget, and so you still have to get it done. And and the pretty shiny new technologies may not be the option. So Haley, how about you? How have you tackled this kind of issue? Yeah, we have implemented a lot of conditional logic. Um, in our workflows, we use Ironclad um, for most of our contracting management. Um, and not only do the conditional logic help um, just streamline approvals and various reviews, but it also creates transparency so that the business um, owners of the deal aren't constantly pinging you about wh what stage the deal is in and who still needs to review. It's very obvious to them and they can have more um, investment in handling deal management as well. Um, in addition, Can I ask you oh, yeah. about the conditional logic? Can you give us an example of one of the ways that you implemented that or one or two of the ways and kind of what's maybe one that people wouldn't think of necessarily or something along those lines? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and we're constantly reevaluating it um, <laughs> with an effort to improve um, and remove questions that don't need to be asked. But um, I mean, at a very basic level, we would take our standard contract and maybe ask some trigger questions like, is there custom co-marketing funds, for example, or are there, um, I don't know, what country is the, are they operating in, as another example? And then it would, autom the, the workflow would automatically pin, you know, pin on any sort of additional order forms or service terms that we might need to have. Um, that would accommodate those terms. Okay. And even where there may be customization that needs to be done manually by our team or reviews that need to be done manually, it saves a lot of time having to, you know, copy and paste, ask these questions up front manually, and then create the document from scratch every time, especially right. when you're dealing with thousands of agreements per quarter. Yeah, no, for sure. And that that high quantity uh, processing is such a different challenge than you know, so doing a lot of contracts is a different challenge than doing less with less contracts, if that makes right. sense. <laughs> um, let me ask you, Jasmine, about how do you d handle this? Yeah, so I I'm going to often uh, answer on the process side and then on the people side as well. On the process side, I totally echo Haley's um, suggestion. We also built in conditional logic workflows that would trigger certain approvals based on answers that were given. We also built those workflows based on the legal review thresholds, which when pressure tested changed, right? When it mm -hmm. suddenly it was like budgets are being cut, you get less lawyers, or actually we can't afford to continue to add lawyers when scale happens or when contracts go up. So those are the moments you make strategic decisions about like, what are you just not going to review anymore? And how are you going to communicate that to the stakeholders? And how are you still going to make it easy for them to make sure that those contracts are well done, well executed? We go I, or how did you do that in advance of those ups and downs? Is that something you did at a strategic level or was it more reactive as needed? So both. I think, you know, going into any role, I sort of set a threshold to say, okay, these are the contracts based on my current team that we're going to review. This is the reality of sort of the situation and this is the diligence. And maybe at one point, you know, right now in my role, it's all of them, right? Uh, at some point it might become on the vendor side, I'm only going to look at stuff in excess of X dollars or on yes. the sales side, deal desk is going to get trained on doing contracts under Y, right? And as frankly, the economy changes and as the business changes, those are the triggers for changing those thresholds. And I think those are the moments you say, okay, we're not looking at these contracts anymore business you're so good at doing this yourself i've built you a workflow all you got to do is answer these questions and also it's click to accept all you got to do is send it to your 
counterpart. And now there's a lot less back and forth involved. So on the process side, I think there's opportunities to leverage technology, really empower the business to do as much without legal as possible, which then reduces our need for overhead. On the people side, the thing I'll offer is, especially when I was junior in house, I thought I had to do everything, no matter how little I had. And so I was like, I'll do it all with nothing. And that would be my value proposition, right? Yeah. And that was not a great approach to doing more with less uh, because that sort of A, sets bad precedent and B, creates a dynamic where you're actually not empowering people in the business to do more. And the reality of tech startups in particular is your counterpart teams are always going to scale and grow faster than legal is. And it is in legal's best interest to make sure that those scaling teams are able to take on some of the responsibilities that rightfully, you know, should be with them in terms of how to do contracts and how to continue to scale. Because we should never have as many lawyers as we have salespeople. That just doesn't make sense. Exactly, exactly. And now I'd love to hear from you too, Jonathan. What do you what are you thinking about on this subject? Yeah, so so like most of my co-panelists, um, I'm supporting every internal function group, um, rev being first and foremost. And so the key for me to doing more with less, it's it's twofold. It's getting as much context up front so you eliminate the back and forth. I mean, some of it is inevitable, but if you get most of the pieces to the puzzle on the front end, that lets you immediately dive into the review and move the process forward in a way that having to go back and forth several times doesn't. Um, second thing is to cut down on as much friction as possible with those handshakes and the, the interchange of information. And for me, a big source of that friction was toggling in between tools. You know, we had things happening in Salesforce, Slack, our email client, Office, Acrobat, DocuSign. And so what we've done now to, to manage that and ensure that we get the context up front and also eliminate the friction is we run everything through a legal intranet. So there are templates, negotiation guidelines, policies, and ed resources. Um, but most helpfully, it integrates with Ironclad for all of our sales deals. And then we've got an Airtable legal services request form that we use for everything else. And both of those workflows are engineered to ask the right questions up front. So we get the context and then we eliminate having to toggle between Slack and Microsoft Office and email. So it's a pretty powerful one-two punch. Yeah, no, and so we're starting to get some quest really great questions in. So I wanted to start with one from Ryan, and I'm going to start with you, Haley, if, if you're open to answering this, which is, how did you get comfortable with not reviewing contracts based on monetary threshold? Because I think Have that's something. <laughs> <laughs> Have your own template. Don't trust the third party form without re reviewing it. Um, okay. Yeah, I would recommend having templates to the extent possible. And I think where something is too custom to be able to templatize, um, maybe consider reviewing or prepare a, a customizable statement of work um, to a templated MSA where you wouldn't review the baseline legal terms, but you might review some commercial terms, for example, mm -hmm. um, on, a, on a much, and that would be on a much smaller scale, obviously, than a full-blown agreement. Yeah. Does anybody else have any thoughts on how you've gotten comfortable with that issue? Yeah, I, I think one thing I'll add is it's a little different on sales than it is on procurement. On the procurement side, you know, I would try to ask the biggest risk questions around like, are we sharing PII? Are they getting access to systems? If the answer to those questions is yes, they're always subject to legal review. If the answer is no, then it's like, okay, how much is this deal worth? Are we on our paper versus theirs? Like to Haley's point, if you're on your paper, you got to worry a lot less. But if you're on theirs, then you figure out what level of review, is it going to be a contracts manager? Is it going to be a lawyer? That kind of thing. On the sales side, um, I think the threshold for me often turns around what terms are they trying to change? And again, if it's on our template and the salesperson is just changing the initial term from 36 months to 12 months, I don't need to look at that, right? I just need to be super confident that they know how to do that themselves and that nothing else in the contract changes when, you know, that's the sort of field that they're able to fill in. Yeah. And I was going to ask, um, maybe for Jonathan and, and Mike, how do you deal with setting those thresholds for what lawyers review, what lawyers don't review? I know, uh, Jasmine, you just mentioned, you know, these two qualities, it always gets reviewed. But then let's say it doesn't have those two qualities or those two features. What do you have a flat number that you use? And how do you set it? And how you know, what are the relationships that you think about in terms of setting those thresholds? Yeah, I'll jump in here. 
I start with a formula and, and my philosophy is that only material risk matter. Mm -hmm. And so in order to be a material risk, two things have to be true. It has to be likely to occur and costly if it does. And so I think once you filter everything through that prism of just saying we're guarding against material risk, then you can sort of start to separate the wheat from the chafe when you look at the workflows and try to decide, hey, which types of contracts inherently present lower material risk, like what Jasmine just mentioned. If PII is not involved, if we're not integrating with anything, that then may naturally weed itself out from the need for that different level of legal review. So, so I start from that point and then sort of work out through the types of deals that we're looking at and sort of filter them all through that prism. Cool. What about Mike? Is that something that you've been doing yourself? Yeah. So I, I think we saw it at the monetary value of zero. If this costs nothing yet, then we probably don't have to look at it, right? We're talking NDAs, low level, low level agreements, right? It's like, you know, some people say an NDA is an NDA is an NDA. Hopefully there's nothing too sneaky uh, that slid in there. But typically I'm going to trust my, my business team because they have seen these time and time again. They're having these conversations with vendors. Um, this is something that's a document that's familiar to them in their personal life and in their business world, in, in their business life. Um, so we're going to we're going to trust that that doesn't need a thorough review so that we can pay attention to the to the high risk and the high value contracts that do. And so so far, we've been able to manage that. Yeah, no, that's great. And then. In terms of we've in this category of who does what, it's also who does what in the business groups or technical groups that you're supporting or compliance groups, whatever it is. Do you have a technique? And I'll put it to you, Jonathan. Do you have a technique that uh, you like to do when it comes to assigning responsibilities to other teams? Yeah, I think I think it starts with arming them with with a good playbook. And we use negotiation guidelines for that purposes or that purpose. And then there's also that conditional component, too. So a lot of our guidelines say here are the guardrails from a language standpoint at the clause level. Here's plan A, here's plan B, and maybe even a plan C. If we're outside of that, that's when you need to come to us. So, so you empower people with that freedom within a framework. And we try to allow our especially our sales team to work autonomously, but within those guardrails. No, that's a great, great point. And it's um, speaking, and I wanted to touch back because we got a great question on getting other side to use your paper, which I know that is a way to do more with less because the more you can have people review your templates, review your paper, the less you have to spend reading, you know, third party paper, especially if you don't have the technology that kind of automates some of that review. So Haley, you talked about templates and how important they are. Do you have a, any techniques that you recommend to try and increase the amount of use of your paper versus using, you know, your teams having to accept the other side? And I know some of this is leverage and, you know, place in the industry and the type of contract. But if you or any of the other panelists um, have any ideas about, because that's such a fundamental issue of to, how to do more with less is to do more on your paper. Yeah, it's a, a classic lawyer answer. It depends on the contract, I think, in terms of what talking points you should use. So we actually have customized talking points for each type of our template. Um, and I think, you know, as an example, a DPA, if we're signing a DPA separately for some reason, um, are, are you the controller or the business? Are you a processor, a, um, you know, or a co-controller potentially? Um, and that will determine how you can kind of argue for using your paper. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing with any other kind of vendor or um, revenue generating contract. But I would work. I would recommend working with the business, um, and also work with your different counterparts. I'm on the revenue generating side, but I work very closely with our vendor side, um, commercial legal team. And we share ideas all the time about how to argue against different counterparty um, arguments because we're obviously hearing the opposing side's point of view. And it really helps. Um, and listen to the business, listen to what they're hearing out in the field and they're on the front lines. So work with them to develop the talking points. Yeah, Laura, Laura I can take this one also. Yeah. Um, I, th I think for for my company, we have two different verticals and then whether it's on our paper ends up being a little bit different and for different reasons on each vertical. So we sell directly to, to you know, we make the crime finding technology. So we're a SaaS company and a hardware company. We have, you know, the software, but we're also installing devices and sending real people, technicians to go install these things. So when we're selling directly to a private entity, to a, to a small, like 
a neighborhood or homeowners association. We talk about leverage. And at that position, they want our product. You know, we're, we're the vendor. And we probably have the leverage there and the know-how to give them our contract. We also sell directly to governments, to law enforcement, to municipalities, gigantic cities. Um, there, they have leverage. And now it's about changing the conversation. It is your standard form is not going to work because yours has to do with like an actual construction contractor or maybe a, a purely SaaS company. And there is no way that the, the terms as you've created them contemplate the issues that will come up with my product. Yeah. Um, so because of that, we, we try to convince them to break their own standard protocol and go on our paper. And if there's specific things that they need to, that they need to add, we're, we're okay with maybe adding an addendum or directly redlining into our agreement with any of their, you know, their state or local regulations, what, what have you. But, uh, yeah. but for both of those, we have a twist into, to, to try to get on our paper as much as possible. Yeah. And, and I'd like to transition to another kind of one of our core topics that we wanted to be talking about, which is, I mean, within the, the concept of the roles and responsibility is who decides what in contracting and who's in charge when it comes to contracting. And Jonathan, I, I'd like to go with you and see what's your approach to who's in charge of contracting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I mentioned that phrase earlier, freedom within a framework. And so what we do is we try to create that framework. And then any time that there's a risk that, that's outside of it that can't be negotiated away, um, we have an established escalation protocol. So, so the first step, if one of my commercial attorneys can't get the risk out of the deal and we think it's a material one, is it goes to me. Um, in most cases, um, I can make the decision and I'm empowered to, to decide on the business's behalf. Um, in other cases, um, I feel more comfortable taking it up to the executive level. And that's where we'll liaise directly with our CEO. If I do um, escalate a matter to the CEO, um, I put together, it's just a one slide presentation, but it's a summary of the deal along with a recommendation and then hopefully a pragmatic explanation of, of where we see the risk and what we ultimately think we'll do. So in that sense, we, we maintain control, you know, from an operation standpoint, but we also give our stakeholders that freedom to be able to self-serve and resolve a lot of things along the way so, so they feel empowered to act autonomously. Yeah. And maybe Haley, if you have anything to add on that. Um, or you know, if you don't, or to anybody right. else. Yeah, no, no problem. No problem. Um, but yeah, that's 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 great. yeah, to just offer that, I think that uh, the escalation process is one that can, you know, sort of go multiple ways. And it takes, I think, some skill and finesse in doing it well, which is, to Jonathan's point, like making it really succinct and saying like, okay, these are the risks. This is the materiality of the risk. This is the likelihood of it materializing. Also, here's my suggestions for addressing the risk, or here's what I've tried already. I think that second piece goes a very long way to say like, okay, you know, I pushed back in this, this, or this way, or these were my creative middle grounds. Like they've rejected all of them. How would you like to proceed? That way there's a full understanding of like, we have actually tried alternatives and it's sort of like, this isn't the first time we're discussing fallbacks or, you know, alternative options. I think it's important to present it that way. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I think the other part of this is the documents. And we've been talking about our documents uh, and Jasmine, maybe continue on of how have you created your documents and what kinds of uh, what's what are you designing them um, or what do you keep in mind when you're designing your documents? What are your priorities? Yeah. So, you know, documentation is probably one of my favorite things. Uh, so <laughs> it's a combination of like, you know, creating our paper and creating our documentation internally. On the second point, documentation internally is making sure that our processes and procedures are very easy to follow and hosted in a place that people can access them very easily. So whether that's an internal wiki, you know, the top of a Slack channel, whatever that is to say like, this is how you're going to get a contract. This is how it's going to get reviewed. This is where you can go find our templates, right? Like there, there should be a systematic approach to presentation to the business of like, this is what commercial is doing. Um, this is how we work. These are the things you might need. These are presentations we've put together in the past. This is our playbook, et cetera. Um, and I think making those as non lawyery as possible, um, plain English, short. And I have found also that like judging them up really makes a difference. Like tables, colors, bold, you know, like mm -hmm. if your internal design team has a PowerPoint, 
follow the design team's PowerPoint. Like they created it for a reason, really emulate the style of the business. I think yes. that's important for internal facing. External facing documentation, I think, you know, I, I actually just recently went through the process of like revising our entire contracts package. And I think doing that on a regular basis with a fresh eye of like, what's the thrash we've experienced in negotiation in the recent past? What are the things that like, actually we don't need to be towing the lion on because they're not high risk items for us. Like let's take yeah. a realistic approach. And, you know, like now that there are new salespeople in the door doing different kinds of deals, how are we going to think about the structures of their, their deals? Like, are they going to influence our paper? Are we going to create addendums? Is there an issue that's, you know, coming up on the security side that necessitates a new addendum or an annex altogether? So really being, I think, nimble and willing to adjust on the outbound side of documentation, I think, is also really important. Yeah. Does anybody have any other points that, you know, you want to add to what Jasmine, Jasmine said on that point? I could chat on this, uh, Laura. I th in talking about design, uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about design of our paper, right? So there's different ways that you can build your contract. You can you can do it focus on, on speed, minimal touches, on um, on thinking about risk and just trying to, you know, think through every single problem that could probably exist and, and to shield your company from that. So the, the way that we've designed our, our contracts and our paper has been around minimal touches. And the way that we've done that is exactly what Jasmine said. And it's, you know, part of our KPIs quarterly is to go back and look at our paper because it's not written in stone and through mental poaching. And the way that we do that is when we find that there are repeat offenders in terms of so certain clause or provisions in our contracts that always get questions, that always get red lines yeah. stricken. And you start to talk to counsel and you realize that that there's probably a real reason why they're either striking it, don't understand it. And it's probably your language. And it's OK to look back and say, this might be written poorly or this is confusing. And we're internal. So we're thinking, well, this makes sense to me. But to someone who has no idea what your product is and maybe just got it from their business person and has no background story, um, they're looking at it with completely fresh and, and novice eyes. So, you know, during during our rewrites, um, you know, we'll take some of that feedback and then take even if it's the way that someone uh, rewrote it and say, like, that was actually a really good way to rewrite this. And then that's how we'll, we'll do some of the. Uh, of this um of this mental poetry because i truly believe that there's no such thing as as good writing just rewriting uh and we try to embed that into my team so that way i know that every everything uh should be rewritten constantly yeah and i was going to say that one of the other things we did was we'd uh schedule something either quarterly or every six months where the people would come in together and we'd look at it together and do just what you were talking about mike now haley do you have any can you share a little bit more about how your you approach the design of documents and how you do you focus on minimal touch by legal and speed or are you focusing on you know risk management and empowering the business or what's your general approach to your documents and documentation um probably all of that <laughs> i know that's not super helpful um but uh, we certainly take a collaborative approach with our documentation. I think this is fair for everyone to say that it's not necessarily just a legal document and we try to constantly make that very clear. Um, so many points are, you know, desired or required by other teams. And so we're constantly in touch with them to make sure that the reasons why we have the clause in there, um, the way that it's phrased, the intent behind it is, is up to date and still needed. Um, I would also recommend um, in terms of, you know, guides for the business, um, not all non-lawyers love to read. So I would recommend trying to be creative too and finding ways to reach the business and empower them without, you know, handing them a manual, which is, I mean, in my experience, not something that they'll often pick up. So open a Slack channel or, you know, Mattermost, whatever you use, that's open for questions and, you know, show that you're there to answer them pick up on questions that are frequently asked and create an FAQ doc. We created an FAQ doc for our counterparties about our agreement um, in addition to an internal one for our business partners, but um, creating office hours, doing mini trainings, creating videos of mini trainings on specific sections or um, other concepts can be really helpful in lieu of just a manual that may not be read. Yeah, those are all fantastic ideas. How about you, Jonathan? What do you, what approaches do you take to your documentation and advice you have? 
yeah, um, obviously the conditional logic is big and, you know, we tried to design an order form that was one size fits all, but, but it automatically customizes and updates based on the products that are added and whether or not we're working with online or offline terms. So mm -hmm. with a few clicks, a bunch of exhibits will shift around and provisions will drop in and out. And, and that's been pretty self-sufficient. Um, one thing that I wanted to echo about what Haley just said, I, I agree about non-legal stakeholders not always being the best readers. Um, something I find that's really helpful is, is the use of analogies. And, and I'm sort of famous for that, or maybe infamous, depending on how you look <laughs> at it. But but I, I love to, to use analogies wherever possible. One example is we were debuting our first SaaS product, and I likened it because the information security practices in the initial draft left something to be desired. And I said, I felt like we've built the world's best cruise ship, and it's beautiful, but but we don't have any lifeboats. And I'm not worried about this hitting an iceberg and sinking. I don't think that's going to happen. I am worried about our customers not walking across the gangplank because they don't see lifeboats, and they expect to see them, and they worry, what if we sink? So so things like that, and I think it, it, there's a way to sort of distill down, and I know one of the questions we got related to translating legal not knowledge in a, in a way that lay people can understand, you know, I find that using those analogies can be really powerful in keeping it simple. And I think the concept, and we've all heard this, you know, people remember and understand stories rather than, you know, factual statements or directions or orders. So the more you can um, relay how to use your documents, how to, to do your commercial contracting with stories, it's going to be much more impactful. So let's move on to the next question, um, or to the question that came in from Xander. And this one is about playbooks for other teams within your company. And what are some of the biggest hurdles that you found when you're translating the legal knowledge, kind of the technical legal concepts, into practical business advice for these other business units? And how did you overcome those hurdles? Maybe Mike, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, do you have any, you know, what I think Jonathan talked a little bit about how he uses these analogies to kind of translate for the business teams. Do you find anything particular works with your business teams or technical teams? Yeah, so there's two things that I find as the hurdles. And one is buy-in, right? So it's just, you know, the sales team usually has are incentivized to sell, right? So then, you know, that's how they're getting paid. That's how they're getting their bonuses and they want to sell regardless of process right um so you know our, our job is some, to some, at some point to reel them in and make sure that we're thinking about the rest of the, co the company and, and doing it correctly and the second thing is just like uh, selective memory loss and that is like you told them once or you trained them once when they first started and then you know they've been here two years they're a top seller and there's no way that they're going to follow that playbook because they've been fine without it and i, and I think that it, it um uh, the two things that work to combat that are one, doing those internal trainings, and I refuse to give them a video or just uh, like Haley mentioned, just a, you know a, a gigantic manual because it would. I, I don't like to read those things, and I don't like to watch training videos. Right? I'd rather have someone on on the Zoom call with me where I can get the real live questions. I can push them through. I can share my screen and really answer questions directly. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll do that once in a while. Um, and the second thing in terms of, uh, of that selective memory loss is redirection. And it's, uh, and it's, you know, you did something wrong. Here's that playbook again, uh, you know, for future reference, can we please fo follow the process? Because when something is a one-off once and you have a gigantic sales team and they're all doing one-offs or asking for favors or asking to please just review this and it didn't follow the process, it slows it down for everybody. Um, so, and, and, you know, and for and a lot of us are at, at startups and you just can't afford to be slow at that high growth stage. So, um, yeah. so I think that's the way that we've, we've combated that playbooks and making them pretty, pretty to Jasmine's point. <laughs> now, Jasmine, Look, arts and art. <laughs> exactly. It matters. It matters. I'm such a believer in graphic design and, and the ability to, you know, spread messages with good, um, organization and design. Um, so Jasmine, I was going to ask you a little bit more about what Mike was just saying in terms of how you're um, convincing people to follow your policies and practices. And there's always the carrot and then there's the stick. And, you know, it's always a combination of both. But uh, uh, what advice do you have? Because I mean, we know that if people follow our processes, 
things move smoother, at least for us, and we can do more with less, and which is the theme of our conversation. So I'd love your feedback on working with them, making sure you get buy-in into those processes and, and procedures. Yeah, I think some of it is actually about visibility, especially in this new distributed world. Um, you know, sometimes people can be like, legal, robots, not real people, not talking to a person, just a machine, don't have to listen, right? The more, frankly, and I know this is not totally the heart of the question, but I, I, I start here because I think it's important. You've got to be a visible face in the business. People have to know that you're a real person. They've got to see you. They've got to hear your voice. They've got to, you know, to, to Mike's point, you got to be doing these trainings in person, make the trainings digestible, interesting, uh -huh. fun, almost, you know, make it something that people want to be a part of, or at least like don't want to reject right out. So I think some of it is like the buy-in. And then, um, you know, the, the secondary part is really convincing them that you are there to empower them to achieve your goals, uh, to, to achieve their goals. And I, that is something I tell to my sales team and my counterparts all the time is like, literally, I'm here to make sure that like you can achieve whatever it is that you need to. And my ethical duty is to pre prevent the enterprise from accepting too much risk in the process. And I can do both of those things at the same time if we work together. And so I think the more I convince people that like we're on the same team, I'm literally here to help you, the more they're sort of willing to be like, oh, th this helps me. Let me like actually listen to what she's saying or let me read this doc that she gave me because this will make the process smoother in the long term. And then sort of painting the picture for them in the future of like, I know this is painful now, like you didn't have a contracts management tool before you were just slacking. Now you have to do this, what feels like an extra step, but in reality, it will reduce all of this manual labor. And when your deal pipeline goes from five to 20, you're going to be so happy that you have this audit trail also, not just me. And so I think really sharing with them the vision of where scale will take them and you is useful. Yeah. And, and Jonathan, do you have, you know, successes that you've found in terms of getting people on board, following procedures and policies and things like that. Yeah, I think you demonstrate the value proposition. And, you know, you demonstrate that in, in so many ways, we, we can actually expedite the process, you know, once we have clear alignment and an understanding of what we're trying to do together. And to echo Jasmine's point about the fact that it's possible to do both things at once, you know, no is rarely the less answer, the right answer in our line of work. It's it's no, however, or yes, but, you know, we're always there to, to streamline creative solutions and find a way forward. You know, we'll present our stakeholders with a menu of options and then in conjunction with the business and our risk tolerance allow them to to choose among them and so i think it, it, it is about that that demystifying legal you know getting out of sort of the dark tower as we used to call it at warner brothers and being on the lot around other people and and letting them know you're a real person and that you have empathy and that you have a, a shared admiration and respect for what they're trying to accomplish and then demonstrate it in the trenches that, that you're a problem solver and you are there to help them you know get around these impasses and untangled nods. I think once you do that, then you really get the buy-in and then you get people who say, well, I actually won't move forward unless we consult with legal or unless we bring this stakeholder to the table. Yeah. Now that makes a lot of sense. And then now, Haley, have you found any techniques that help you kind of deal mm -hmm. with in a sense, this, the approach of process and procedure, but also those who are especially resistant because we've all worked with people who just, you know, no matter how convincing you are, they just dig in and they just want to resist. Do you have any particular techniques you do use in those cases? Um, I mean, one technique that's been successful is kind of taking what Jonathan and Jasmine mentioned, but building a business case around something you're going to launch. And even if you're going to do it anyway, getting sign off from the sales leadership or CSM leadership or, who you know, whatever leadership needs to sign off on or is nice to have to sign off on so that you can demonstrate that this has full cooperation and partnership across both teams um, and also building out that business case so you can demonstrate too to this person who's maybe being difficult um, why it's important. Um, I think too just arming arming your team with talking points to deal with people who are not really on board with what you want. And I mean, they just want speed. And so focusing your talking points around why this benefits them, why this benefits the company, 
um, and ultimately we'll move things along faster, uh, which hopefully is the goal. And I love the idea of talking points because it also has the benefit of consistency with of answers because we all know the internal folks who know which lawyer or which contract manager will approve what quickly and which ones are more difficult. So they do some forum shopping there and getting your team consistent um, is so important. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about or go on to technology and talking about what kind of technology you're using to do more with less. And I, we've heard a couple people talk about different, um, you know, uh, Slack or Ironclad or things like that. So I'd like to just kind of ask you if you have anything beyond, you know, the CLM system or beyond Slack that you find is really helpful in terms of doing more with less or whatever tools that you're using that you just love that help you do your job and your team do your job. And I'll say, you know, Mike, uh, do you have any tools that sure. you're using? Yeah, well, well, luckily we graduated from that that Slack workflow that I was talking <laughs> about, right? And got a little yeah. bit more technologically advanced. Uh, and then we, you know, we, we built out the integration from Salesforce with, with DocuSign's CLM. Um, okay. So then that is, you know, fully integrated and gives the, uh, the salesperson direct view into what is happening. So from the opportunity, they're, they're creating the SKUs. We've talked a lot about conditional logic. Uh, fantastic. If you haven't noticed by now, we're all firm believers. Um, and then being able to, you know, pick the products and auto generate into uh, DocuSign CLM. And, you know, most of us know DocuSign maybe from our private lives of signing our lease or whatever the case may be. But the really cool thing is that what it has done is taking the salesperson completely out of it after that, because mm -hmm. from there, they can send it directly to either um, their point of contact who's going to sign it or to the, their legal counsel. And DocuSign has an integrated native redlining feature within it. So from there, they're able to, you know, the, the other the uh, other opposing counsel can make some changes. Whether or not they, they put uh, track changes on, when they send it back, it's going to come to me. Um, and I'm going to see all of the changes. And we can now take that salesperson out of the middle ground, uh, out of the, uh, as, as being the middle person. So that way they keep and build that relationship and they establish rapport and they're not the bad person, right? They're yeah. not the legal said, we can't do this. And they're usually in the middle of it, right? <laughs> we have completely taken them out, put the two lawyers in touch, negotiate the contract. And then right when it's done, it's ready for signature. It's all built out in DocuSign. Um, and then, you know, that's going to save in that repository, uh, trigger CPQ billing. It's another sales, uh, Salesforce product. And then the entire thing is packaged up with a nice bow. And I sound like I'm doing a commercial for Salesforce. For <laughs> but, uh, it really has, it really has, has changed um, the workflow because uh, when we talked about minimum touches that, you know, there's minimum touches for opposing counsel and me, but it's also minimum touches with people in the business. And yeah. I think that that has driven speed. Yeah. And I think, you know, people who have not have uh, been surviving without a CLM and then get one, it's such a, you know, awakening moment to discover what you really can do. And maybe Jonathan, if you want to talk to kind of your approach to technology and tools and the way that they support you doing more with less. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that I would say is, um, is within the CLM, I, I really want to highlight that ability to, to tag things and archive things in a way that then lets you draw upon it quickly. Anyone who's gone through an equity financing understands that the relevance and the importance of that. And, um, you know, the time to repair the roof is while well, the sun is shining, not, not when you're in the middle of diligence. So, so that's definitely something that, that we leverage quite a bit. Um, everybody's talked about the CLM side of things. So I'll talk about sort of the other side of our intake form, which goes through Airtable. I mentioned earlier, Earlier, the importance of context. Um, we've got a questionnaire sort of automatic with drop down on Airtable. So when someone requests legal services, they're going to get asked a series of questions. Some of those are conditional. So if you answer one yes, then you're going to get another question to pop up. But the idea is it really paints that full picture for us. So at the time that the, the matter is first presented to the legal team, you know, whoever receives it should have everything they need to, to be able to sort of get a draft put together or complete the review with sort of minimal back and forth or minimal question. 
events. Um, the other thing that we've introduced, which is nice, is we have a system to assign things um, sort of equally. Now, that doesn't mean every matter takes the same amount of time. Some days you get a 30 minute red line and another day it's a, it's a two hour red line. But we do try to sort of ping pong um, or popcorn a little bit matters amongst members of our legal team to make sure everybody's getting a well-balanced diet of work and also a relatively equal amount of work. And then we'll triage on our team weekly call where we have to. Um, and then, like I said, everything runs through sort of a standard intranet, which is the source of truth. Um, it's designed to be a good self-serve, um, you know, portal for our stakeholders. But um, it also helps us to ensure that we're always working off the latest and greatest versions of the templates because they're all bait stamped and it's really easy to go on the intranet and sort of track them. So a combination of those tools and what I would tell you, we're not there yet, but the next frontier may be to dip our toes in the water of some of the AI and machine learning stuff that's out there, although I don't have a good enough handle yet on what that's capable of and how it performs. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Jasmine, how are you dealing with your technology? Like what are your favorite tools? What are your favorite um, tech stacks that you rely on? Yeah, what's really interesting for me in my position is I'm actually going back to early stage after having been in late stage. And so it's really fascinating for me to be like, oh, I don't have budget for a lot of things I used to use. And so I'm back to the basics right now. And I'm remembering the value of Google Forms, of Google Docs. And to anybody else that's listening that's in an early stage company, like I will say those things are your friends, especially if you've got limited budget and you don't want to spend it on a tool where maybe your volume doesn't justify it right now. So a lot of what I'm doing right now is in those spaces, an interesting integration we actually just launched also off of our Salesforce database is monday.com, which I know a lot of folks use for organization tools. I'm actually using it as a makeshift CLM right now, and it's working out pretty well. Um, the tickets auto populate to Monday. You can have intake questions. There's an app feature with an ability to attach documents. It's, you know, proving itself to be kind of a wonderful interim solution. Uh, and so that's something that I'd suggest to folks if, if you're sort of without a lot of means in this moment. Yeah, no, that's fantastic because there are so many people who don't have that budget and aren't able to do it and trying to do more with less. Um, how about you, Haley? What kind of technology are you using that you really appreciate? I think you talked about Ironclad before. Are there other things or things that are you found really helpful? Um, so I realize that Ironclad may be out of budget at this point for many, uh, for some companies. Um, but I would still say Ironclad, um, if you can swing it because, um, while the tool isn't perfect and it's not all encompassing, it does provide a lot of optionality that a lot of tool, other CLMs don't provide. Um, it has a click wrap option. It is a great, um, record keeping tool, which is one of the most important things that I feel like, um, uh, a lot of tools have gaps in and, um, you know, it provides every aspect of CLM with really complex, customized conditional logic trees um, and has a lot on the roadmap. That's really exciting. So, yeah, I would stick with that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. And that's great. And because when you do have a really robust CLM, you know, you don't have to do a lot of makeshift with everything else um, because it takes care of things for you. Now, we've been talking about kind of contract management. What about change management and, and the way that you go about implementing new technology, implementing new things? Do you have any of you had any experiences that you'd share with others in terms of being successful in getting people on board to a new technology or to a new platform? What was maybe, you know, each of you, if you have one thing that was your best advice, uh, having been through change management with contract technology, what was what were you able to do to get people to, to come on board? And Jonathan, if you have anything, I, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, d demonstrate what it's going to do for them. Yeah. How's it, how's it going to help you and make your life better? You know, they, they don't care, frankly, what it's going to do for legal and, and yeah. the guardrails and the, the framework. They, they want to know, how does this make it easier for me to complete my motion? And so that's what I would sell. Yeah. Does anybody else have any advice on change management? I think one bit of advice I'd share is ensuring you have a very well-defined comms and rollout plan that you share with cross-functional leaders across the business that you require, you know, where you're requiring the buy-in of their teams. And so 
your head of sales, your head of procurement, your, you know, whoever else might be involved in the contracting potential process. Like if, you know, for example, in rolling out ironclad in a previous um, location, making sure you're explaining, like, this is the date that it's going live. These are the comms I'm going to send out. These are the dates I'm going to send them out. These are the trainings I'm going to do. Here's the link to the training deck. If you want to look at it in advance, like these are things that sometimes are so ops focused that when we're doing our legal like our lawyer stuff, we're like, we don't have time for that. That's not, you know, my focus right now. But when dealing with change management, I think it's essential to making it successful and making it something that the leaders then feel bought into. And then they have the language they need to convince and cascade down to their teams. Yeah, absolutely. And similar to what I mentioned before, I, you know, a lot of these teams are not going to read your email about some random tool that they've never heard of that they don't even want to know about. And they're not going to read guidelines. So to Jasmine's point, create office hours, have, you know, snippet videos, um, have an open Slack channel or whatever it is that will well in advance prepare them so that they feel that at least if they're not comfortable with the tool, they have a source to go to. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And it, it actually goes to another one of the questions that came in, which was, do you provide any incentives for your sales teams for successfully using your paper? And, you know, this comes back to that carrot and stick idea. And we've talked about, you know, the communication and we're aligned and we, we let us help you. Are there any other things that you're doing to kind of get compliance and motivate your teams to follow the contracting policy? Just uh, Jonathan, if you have anything else on that side that is, um, you know, just relating to this question of, or maybe none of you have provided sales incentives to your teams to comply. I, I haven't tried it, but we've talked about it. And um, it's definitely something that, that I would be open to. You know, I think we would just want to think at any time you, you talk about incentives, you want to make sure that you're incentivizing the right behavior. So an example of maybe how not to do this, if you're getting into it, is um, we had a bread and butter project product that was making up the majority of our ARR for seven years. And when we launched a new SaaS application, we decided to remove all the incentives for selling that bread and butter pro product. We wanted to sell a very specific story about our growth as a SaaS company, but, but, but the effect was, here's the, the analogy again, as I said, it was like we had a family of five who walked onto a car lot and wanted to buy a minivan and sales was trying to sell them a sports car. And when they said, we don't need a two-seater sports car, we need a minivan, sales was saying, well, I'm not incentivized to sell you the minivan, therefore I'm not going to try very hard to sell it to you. So, so I haven't tried incentives but if we do try them i will think about possible ripple effects and unintended consequences of those incentives yeah for sure yeah I, I, we haven't done those that type of incentive um, the financial incentive for successfully using paper is like a, almost like a golden dipped carrot that sounds fantastic <laughs> but I, I think that uh, in talking with my sales team it's just they're incentivized uh, again we keep coming back to speed and i think it's because it's like okay we can check out you know their really robust paper you know that's going to take me maybe a couple days longer. Or you could somehow convince them to use our paper and there will be a 24-hour turnover, right? And for them, with quarterly close and, and quotas in mind, they're thinking, how do I you know, push our paper? Um, because, again, to Haley's point, they're not necessarily caring about risk and what legal is doing. It's going to, it's going to be you know, about the deal and, and, getting, to, uh, and, and getting to close. So uh, it's, I think it's almost a self-incentive uh, incentive. Right. Yeah, we break it into our thresholds and oh, yeah. timelines. So to that point, Mike, we we actually do incentivize by how much time it'll take to review. And we let them know in advance it'll take an exorbitant amount of time It's a, if it's on a third-party paper. Exactly. And we may or may not like you less. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, we're getting closer to the end. And so I thought I'd wind up with a, a question for each of you, which is, if, you know, we talk did some prep in advance of this webinar. I know you collected some thoughts. For each of you, is there something that you had thought of in advance that you didn't get a chance, one piece of advice or one point that you wanted to make that you'd like to make now about doing more with less? And it's a sp spontaneous question I'm putting you all on the spot. So whoever has knows what they want to say off top right away, I'll start Hi. with you. 
I can jump in here. Um, okay, awesome. So, but everybody went, else, get yours ready. <laughs> before I went to a tech startup, I worked for a, a global architecture firm, one of the largest architecture firms in the world. And the general counsel said something to me that took took me a while to process, but it ultimately, you know, resonated, which is eighty percent. You know, I think we are programmed as as a lot of type A lawyers overachieving, wanting to get it perfect and wanting every I to be dotted and T to be crossed. But what we're doing is managing risk and and most risks don't present themselves and certainly don't present themselves all of the time. So so I sort of go with the prevent defense model where if, if I'm at 80 percent and obviously my most salient risk always need to be negotiated away or almost always. But 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 give yourself that grace. Don't don't feel like you've got to go through the document one more time and make sure everything's 0.12 and not one thing's 11 point. You've got a lot to do and, and, and that doesn't that doesn't affect anything at the end of the day. No one's going to die wishing all their fonts had been, you know, normalized. Oh and so so I would just say that piece is give yourself grace and, and 80% is actually doing a heck of a job. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, Jasmine, do you have one piece of advice that you want to give out? Yeah, I it's, it's so hard to distill it to one. So the one I'm going to pick for now is a reminder that sort of like, as lawyers to Jonathan's point, like we all have, I think, somewhat similar styles and similar charges, especially on the commercial side. And the thing I like to tell myself is that like, no matter what side of a transaction we're on, we're actually like part of a similar or the same team being attorneys representing companies. And I think from like a inter like interrelationship perspective, I think it's really important to treat each other with like respect and similar admiration and appreciation. And so often, like, especially in environments where we're doing more with less, the stress can sort of create high pressure environments where like negotiations don't have to go the way they go. They, we can choose different. And so my takeaway is like in this environment where like, we're probably going to have to do more and more with actually less and less. Like if, if this economy continues the way it does is like, you know, reminder that like, I think we're all in similar boats and it's really important for us to be kind and collaborative and know that like, ultimately we want to sell you what your company wants to buy and you want to buy what we're selling you. So like, let's be nice to each other in the process of like getting that done. Yeah. So, and we're almost out of times, but Mike and, and Haley, I want to hear if you can give me yours in about 30 seconds or one minute. Yeah, yeah I can real quick. Um, uh, I think my advice comes, especially to some of the first time in-house counsel people out there, um, you know, it, who, this is their first in-house gig. And I think it's about, uh, you know, being more with maybe less of that in-house experience. And the way to do that is to remember that when you go in-house, you are no longer just a lawyer. You are a business person that happens to have a law degree. And if you're a business partner to your RevOps team and to the business, you will be loved and it will make things a lot easier. Fantastic. What about you, Haley? Last um, last point of the seminar. I, yeah, I'd quickly say um, try to have the mentality all the time that you can do more with less, um, not just in difficult times. And in that, I would say if you're in the position to be able to hire, hire people who also are interested in not just redlining day in and day out, but people who are interested in improving and scaling. Um, I don't hire people who are not interested in that kind of initiative based work, um, even if it's not a core part of their role, um, because it creates a team of brainstormers and people who are constantly looking for ways to do more with less so that you're not having to do it at the most pinnacle point in time of the company's, you know, troubles. So yeah. no, that's such great advice. And thinking ahead um, on that point is fantastic. So thank you to the panelists. I will turn it back to Melissa. Whoops. Oh, you're on mute, Melissa. <laughs> the dreaded mute. The dreaded mute. Apologies. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura, Mike, Kaylee, Jonathan, and Jasmine for sharing all of your wonderful expertise. Our next event will take place next Tuesday with the GCs of Truvive and Green Care Collective, who will be talking about being innovators in the cannabis space. You can RSVP in the chat. Thanks for joining and we'll see you all soon. Have a good afternoon.